Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and this episode of the podcast is going to be one of one of those that is immediately applicable to a lot of coaches and athletes out there, and that is because it has to do with a training intervention that I know a lot of you use and a training intervention that we have very little, if any, research on despite the fact that we don't know a whole heck of a lot about it, and that is the use of weight vests in the sport of trail and ultra running. So y'all welcome to the podcast today, Diego Hyen Carrillo out of the University of Innsbruck. He just happened to produce with his group one of the very first papers that looked at how weight vests actually affect biomechanics and different kinematic properties and how that is in fact applicable to you. I found this podcast and this conversation absolutely fascinating. I found the piece of research absolutely fascinating. A link to that research will actually be in the show notes. And the setup for this research was actually quite elegant. The design was actually quite elegant where he took a group of runners and measured them without a weight vest at 5% of their body weight and at 10% of their body weight and looked at all these different biomechanical properties. Once again, I'm not going to spoil the I'm not going to spoil the outcome of this research, but I do think it's one where people are going to start to think about the use of weight vests a whole lot differently after they view this particular piece of research. All right, folks, with that as a backdrop, I am getting right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Diego Hyen Carrillo, all about the use of weight vests in trail and ultra running. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I appreciate you uh, jumping on the uh, jumping on the horn with me. Um, interestingly enough, this is we're going to talk about a topic that for years I've actually tried to find a lot of research on, and you're already kind of like nodding your head because you know where I'm going to go with this question. And um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, there hasn't there hasn't been a lot of exploring of this particular topic, despite the fact that using weighted vests as a training intervention is actually quite common, not just in trail running, but across a wide variety of sports. We use it in strength of power sports. Uh, they've used it in uh, track running, but then in, in, in all, and also in trail running. And whenever there's this discrepancy between what we see in practice and what we see a lot of athletes do and research where there's kind of an absence of the research, I always get kind of quite curious about it and almost start to dig into the kind of the biomechanical fundamentals and try to, in, in this case, the biomechanical fundamentals and really extrapolate from there. So I'm appreciative that you're doing the, the some of the work that you're doing. But, but before we get into it too much, can you give the listeners a little bit of a background just on you and the lab that you work in and some of like your previous work just so they can kind of get to know you a little bit better? Yeah, so uh, Jason, first of all, thank you very much for for the invite. It's a it's a great honor to be to be here with you. And yeah, so uh, uh, where that my or well, from where come my my interest in in this, right? And what's my background? Uh, I studied sports science in 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 Spain, and after that, I. I completed my master in high performance sport, and and yes, yeah, so during my master, for the thesis of my, the thesis of of my master was about uh, ACL injuries, but uh, then after that, I just uh, I just took a a gap in the uh, in academia, yeah, so in the in the academic career, and I was just. Uh, working as a as a physical education teacher, not only in Spain but also in Germany. And once I got back to Spain, uh, I, it happened that I started working uh, at the University of San Jorge in in Zaragoza. And something that happened to me is that I met. Uh, my one of of the supervisors of my thesis of my phd thesis and this is this was like love at first sight yeah so uh i found someone who was passionate about about running biomechanics and and i just knew that i wanted to come to, 
to do my PhD thesis with with him. And and if you go into my research, you're gonna see many papers uh, that we have uh, worked together. So he's Luis Enrique Roche. Yeah, and the other the other guy is Felipe Garcia Pinillos. They they two were my supervisors, and and yeah, so they they taught me uh, quite a quite a few things. Yeah, about running, about science, about about life at the end. Yeah, and we focused on uh, lower limb stiffness in long in long distance running. And we based this lower limb stiffness uh, on Spring's mass model that I, I, I assume that you are very familiarized with. And as, as you know, uh, this Spring mass model is very useful in order to uh, describe how we behave when running, right? And in order to uh, describe that, you need spatiotemporal parameters, yeah? And in order to calculate or estimate lower limb stiffness outside of the lab or without uh, um, treadmill, also implemented treadmill with uh, force plates and so on. Uh, really sophisticated equipment. Yeah, yeah, so not all the labs have that equipment, right? And then, yeah, we we wanted to do something uh, applicable, so not only in the lab but also outside. And then, yeah, so we 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 went into spatiotemporal parameters, uh, uh, step frequency, contact time, flight time, duty factor, uh, 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 um, step length, and lower limb stiffness, so leg stiffness and vertical stiffness, and. It happened that I completed my PhD. Then I started working as an assistant professor at the uni. I was working before also as, le as a lecturer. Yeah. And, and yeah, so uh, after five years, uh, I got a, a job offer from the University of Innsbruck when I'm uh, working right now. And I thought that was high time for a change, but uh, I'm still working with, with with my group in Spain. Yeah, so I I work very closely with Antonio Carton Llorente, with Alberto, with Luis, with Felipe. Yeah. And and yeah, so I still consider that they are my group. Okay. And <laughs> even though I'm I'm joining or I joined another group here. Yeah, and I'm quite happy because I'm I'm learning other ways of working, and that was what I was looking for. And, and yeah, so uh, this is my my last seven eight years. Just uh, summarize as as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always hard to summarize that that length of time in just a few minutes. Yeah. I so we're going to talk about a paper that you, that this group just came out with, and the title of it is "Is Training Specificity in Trail Running: A Single Arm Trial of the Influence of Weighted Vest on Power and Kinematics in, tra in Trail Runners." And these titles always tend to, tend to blur along. But basically, you're putting weighted vests on trail runners, and you're asking them to, to run at a variety of speeds and underneath a few different weighted conditions. We're going to get into the paper proper, but first off, what what's the origin of this, right? Because once again, this is, it's not like, like there have been other studies here, but they're not all that prevalent within trail running specifically. So where did you guys come up with the idea that, hey, we're going to strap weight vests on trail runners to have them run at a few different body percentage of body weight and a few different speeds and see what happens? Yeah, yeah. So I've been always a fan of, of trail running uh, and I just started I started uh, training people so training athletes and and training myself as well and I heard from other coaches that they use this intervention and I started just doing some research on the or, or 
uh, literature review, right? It sounds like and the I same found, thing I went through, right? I saw yeah, something and, as an intervention, and then I tried to figure out why. Yeah, and I found nothing. Exactly. That's exactly what I, I found. found nothing. nothing. I, I, and 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 if you look at the discussion, I only discuss my so the the results that we found with a couple of papers on sprinting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then we found nothing, nothing at all. And then I thought, yeah. So then many coaches are implementing this intervention, but they don't really know what's happened. Yeah. So, or we we don't really know what happened. Yeah. Then uh, we decided to uh, do a very easy to do study. So easy an, an easy study with a great exercise test with different uh, uh, percentages of body weight uh, on the vest, and then let's see what happened. Yeah. So. Uh, and that that was the origin, uh, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy, but like you have to start somewhere, right? That's yeah. what I always that's what I always bring up when we start to evaluate research and people get into this nuance of, oh, well, they should have done this condition or that condition or whatever. You have to start somewhere, and since there kind of is like literally nothing at this point, this is where you chose to start, and is honestly like it usually ends up being the most reasonable and practical of all the different permutations of these types of studies that can actually come out is usually the original few of them end up having the most practical, like, like use case values. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that, you know, you were training yourself. You're also advising athletes on different types of training interventions. You're observing coaches use weighted vests as a training intervention. And you wanted to kind of like really peel it apart we're we're going to like go for the jugular first and and like go straight to the result and then we'll kind of like back up into that with the actual study design and and specifically what what came out of the study but looking at it through a coaching application and through a training application what are the use cases as you see right now of using weighted vests as a training intervention for trail and ultra runners yeah so uh what what we found or oh, oh. Yeah, what we found was that, uh, oh, we decided first. Let me let me do a a, a gap. Yeah, so yeah. we decided to use uh five percent and ten percent of the body weight because after talking with athletes, coaches, and so on, we saw that the most common weight that they were carrying during their races was about two two kilos, three kilos, maximum, maximum four kilos, then two kilos, 0.5, one kilo. Yeah. Then we decided, we thought, um, yeah. So then how can we get that? Okay. Uh, with something that we can standardize. Yeah. Right. So because so you're, you're not saying race, that you're looking at a race situation and saying a mandatory kit, which is more common in Europe than it is in the, in the United States, that's going to cost somebody about two kilograms worth, depending upon the, the type of kit. So you're looking at that as kind of the original basis is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 That's what, that's what I'm saying. And, and then trying to standardize just, you know, that to go one step forward, uh, the reviewers of the paper, we thought of the standardization of the, of the, of the weights. Yeah. Because it's not the same that a female athlete, 45 kilos carrying five kilos than a male athlete, 70 kilos carrying out five kilos. Yeah. And then that's why we uh, decided to use percentages of body weight. Yes. In order to normalize the, or standardize the, yeah. the, the, the conditions. Yeah. And yeah, if, if we do a spoiler of the take home message, yeah, <laughs> that was what, what, what we are what we are aiming to do right now. So, um, if your question goes in the direction of, can you give a a practical uh, intervention or practical uh, advice of how many times per week do you need to do this or how many times in a uh, in a block can you do that? 
uh, that's a question that I cannot answer. Why? Because I haven't done any intervention. Okay. Right. Our study was just a descriptive study, so a cross-sectional study. Then we looked at the acute effects. Okay, but we don't know what can happen if we implement this intervention for eight weeks, for example. Let's say eight weeks, a couple of times a week. Yeah. So for example, uh, uh Tuesdays and Fridays, yeah, we do maybe easy runs, okay, or maybe we do interval training. Or oh, I cannot say that. Yeah. Okay because I, I don't know it yeah because i i haven't tested yeah and then uh i'm a coach but i'm also a, a scientist and 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 i need evidence in order to give answers and most of the answers are just hey this works with my athletes okay or with me or with this group of athletes with these characteristics right but i don't know if this is going to work with another different population yeah so with other characteristics uh, uh athletes are, are uh aiming at different distances yeah so i can say that yeah because because i i don't know it right and so you're taking the very stereotypical researcher response and trying to yeah and trying to caveat the answer as much as possible but if you look within the study itself there's a one of the things that kind of come comes out very quickly is there's kind of a line of demarcation, so to speak, of which you can increase the weighted vest to a certain percent, and that starts to train that starts to change some of the kinematic variables that you're that you're actually that you're actually looking at. And I think from a from from a training perspective, that's actually quite impactful. Yeah, we can get into the how frequently you need to introduce the intervention and over what duration do you need to introduce the inv- intervention to 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 kind of elicit some sort of adaptation but if you're just looking at the biomechanical parameters which is what you're looking at there's a very clear they're the same here and they're the difference over here that's what i'm initially trying to bring out and then we can go into the in, into the research design so what is what is that piece of counsel essentially for the for the athletes that are out there yeah uh, what we found is that at a percentage of 5% body weight, we get, uh, oh, the running kinematic is not uh, uh, altered. Yeah, so running kinematic is stable and is uh, very, very uh, comparable to running without uh, loaded uh, vests. Yeah. So, and furthermore, what we found is that these light loads, so five percent of the of of the athlete's body weight, stimulate leg spring stiffness and power output. Yeah. Uh, you can think, uh, yeah, power, but not many athletes work uh, using power. Uh, I, I I I disagree. Yeah. So I think. Many athletes uh, train with power, and even though in trial running, pace is not so so important as in as in road runners, yeah, because of the uh, of the nature itself of trail running, yeah. So different profiles, different inclinations, uphill, downhill, flat again uphill so uh a, a gradient up to where most of athletes start working start instead of running then it makes sense that uh we need to aim at stimulating other parameters that pay than than pacing pacing of course it it worth also uh uh working on yeah I'm not saying that pacing is right. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. But, let's, uh, let's let's let's, pa- let's let's pause really quick because I think it's this is getting a, l- a little bit scattered. Let's walk through the research design that you deployed, and then we can kind of come back to this like ultimate answer uh, after we've kind of like narrowed it down. So you took a group of runners, you applied a different percentage of body weight. 
zero percent, five percent, and then ten percent of body weight with a weighted vest, and tested tested their kinematic variables over a range of uh, a range of speeds. Why don't you walk the Why don't you walk through the listeners through just that specific design, and then why you chose the speeds that you chose, and why you chose the 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 weighted vest options that you chose? Yeah, the speed that we chose were based on uh, the speeds that are more commonly used in long distance running. Yeah, so in ultra distance, uh, uh, for example. Yeah, so uh, we know that uh, trail runners start were, uh, uh, running at seven seven point four kilometer per hour and so on. So then we started at eight kilometer per hour. Uh, uh, per hour. That means that most all of them. So in in our case, for with the participants that we had, all of them needed to run at that speed. Right. Then. That has a very easy, uh, light intensity, yeah, of, of of running, yeah. Then we go to ten, we go to twelve, and to fourteen, yeah. Then those uh, uh, velocities, those speeds, are speeds that are commonly seen in inclinations, yeah. So in in, in different gradients, yeah, when in elevation gain, then. We, with all our, our, our participants, we did a, a, a great exercise test. So we started at eight until volitional exhaustion. Yeah. But we wanted to focus on those speeds at the end of the, of the protocol because while we were doing the protocol and we were, when, when, while we were collecting data, we were also collecting. Uh, the answers of the or the feedback from the participants, yeah. So according to the uh, pacing strategies, okay, and 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 that's why at the end we uh, 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 decided to go for those speeds, and and with the uh, three different conditions in body weight, is just following all the information that 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 we gathered about. Uh, weighted or, or the, the 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 vest that they used during races, okay, uh, and how or what's the weight that those racing vests are? Yeah, so we were just asking around, yeah, asking athletes, not only uh, recreational athletes that we that we had in our in our in our study, but also uh, elite athletes, and 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 yeah, at the end we saw that. This range of 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 uh, percentages of body weight would be very close to the weight that most athletes carry during uh, their competitions. Okay, I, I'm going to add a little bit of context here. So, 15 subjects, uh, all, yep. all males. You're measuring the the kinematic variables with the stride power meter, which a lot of people yep. are familiar with. So it's just a little pod that gets attached to the to the to, to the foot. Uh, yeah. But validated in terms of the ver- in terms of the variables that you're actually uh, measuring across, um, you mentioned earlier that this is a device that we're that we're seeing kind of like more and more in the running world. Not quite as applicable from a trail running perspective because the surface of the trail obscures a lot of the values that you're getting. But if you're running on flat level surface, that doesn't really change in terms of a stiff. It's, in terms of its stiffness, it's a reasonable proxy for a lot of the traditionally uh, uh, captured kinematic variables that would take much more sophisticated uh, equipment to, uh, to to actually procure. So you had those 15 individuals go through a standard greater, graded exercise test to get a baseline on their kind of current capacity. They, went, they then went through the testing protocol, which uh, consisted of either running with no weighted vest, a weighted vest at 5% of their body weight and a weighted vest at 10% of their body weight in a randomized format, which is really important yep. because of the learning part of it. I thought that was a good study design. And within each one of those conditions, they ran at eight kilometers an hour, 
10 kilometers an hour, 12 kilometers an hour, and 14 kilometer, kilometers an hour for a period of time. That was, uh, uh, what was the period of time again? Was the standard four or five minutes? Uh, or one, yeah, uh, one minute. What oh, minute, minute. It's, okay. it's so velocity. Minute. Yeah, yeah. So one minute for each of those. And then you're capturing the kinematic variables uh, across each one of those and then comparing all of the different conditions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. That's what, that's what so now, we did. <laughs> now that we've got the general, now that we've got the generalized study design, let's go into the kind of the meat of it. Which were, which were, were there any differences in any of the any of the kinematics or any of the biomechanics? So let's first take like within the speed conditions of any one of those trials. Yeah. So we know that as speed increases, stride length and stride frequency both increase to different proportions but do you see that actually differently across the different weight conditions as well and is that stride length and stride frequency increase different across those conditions yeah interestingly enough stride length was stable during all the conditions and step frequency as step frequency as well why step frequency step frequency is very uh run a dependent okay mm -hmm. so we all run with uh at a very 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 close step frequency to the optimal frequency for for all of us if we run at 170 steps per minute for example probably our optimal step frequency in order to have our best uh running economy is going to be 172 178 so it's going to be very close to that preferred step frequency that we have naturally, yeah? So, and it's the same with the straight line. The straight line is very dependent on, on our architecture, yeah, of bone architecture, our muscles architecture. So it's very difficult to change that. So just when, that, that's the reason when, when, when I see on social uh, networks that you need to give longer steps then uh, you need to run on your forefoot or you need to do this in order to get a better technique so please don't do that yeah so, <laughs> okay. uh, so yeah. amongst the weighted <laughs> conditions though stride length and stride frequency was remarkably stable right we can compare yeah. a 10 percent body weight yeah. condition at the same speed to zero body weight con uh, condition and stride length and stride frequency were actually quite stable, which kind of makes sense, right? Because that's the fundamental equation, right? Velocity equals st stride length times stride yeah. frequency. So we wouldn't yeah. expect that to, to change. Yeah. So what did change? Because everybody knows that when they put on their race pack or maybe not even a weight, weighted vest, right? Their mandatory kit or their kit that they're using for a big, like, you know, backcountry expedition day, they know that they feel different running around. And if you're telling them that stride length and stride frequency doesn't change, they're gonna they're gonna you know call BS on that because they can feel something actually change. So what are yeah. what are the differences? Yeah. So uh, the differences that we found, for example, between no external body weight or no loaded uh, condition and ten percent condition for ten uh, percent body weight condition, for example, is that. Uh, we found significant changes in flight time. So that is the time that we spend on the air while running, okay? And we also found uh, a significant increase in ground contact time. So the time that we spend on the, on, on the ground while running and of course, duty factor. Why we found significant changes in duty factor because the duty factor is the ratio of contact time divided by two times contact time plus flight time, then that's easy. If we found significant differences in flight time and in ground contact time, we are going to find significant differences in duty factor because it's uh, uh, duty factor is a related parameter, yeah. And if we look at the 5% uh, body weight condition, here, what we found was very interesting because we didn't find any significant, cha significant changes in any of the running uh, parameters so in no changes in ground contact time flight time wherever okay but as, as i mentioned before we found uh, uh, significant changes in leg spring stiffness so increase leg stiffness 
Yeah, and 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 it seems that these five percent additional body weight is an appropriate strategy to stimulate leg spring stiffness. That if you don't know, or, or we, if if people are going uh, uh, listening to us, don't know. So leg spring stiffness is one of the main uh, uh, neuromuscular mechanisms in order to regulate, or in order to uh, yeah, to regulate the the um, elastic energy we use when when running yeah so when 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 we do the initial contact while running we absorb energy okay in, during the mid stance and then we release part of that energy when uh propulsion the body into the air again in order to keep running yeah so if we are able to stimulate leg spring stiffness so probably not probably but if we stimulate leg stiffness we are going to be, oh, oh, our running economy is going to be slightly optimized, okay? And we also found increase in power, yeah? So this is, this is, uh, this is crystal clear, yeah? Because if we have more weight on us, so we are going to generate more power at the same speed, okay, at 8, 10, 12 and 14 kilometers per hour. That's clear. But uh, uh, we also found that at the 10% body weight condition, more power, but a significant decrease in ground contact time that is directly uh, related to running performance. So if we find those the uh, geopardizing sites yeah, or, or those handicaps, uh, we are indeed uh, 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 impairing running performance, right. right? Yeah. It almost, so when I look at this from a coaching lens, it almost seems like the right dose, if you're going to use an assisted weighted vest, has a U shape curve to it, to where once you exceed the top of that, you know, U or N, depending upon how your X axis is actually oriented, right? Um, to once you exceed that external load, the, sure. the, 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 the use of that training intervention becomes a net negative as opposed to a net positive. And this, that's, this is a dose response curve that is, you know, quite common in a lot of biomechanical and, and physiological properties where you can apply a load to a certain extent and it's a positive, or you can apply additional load to a certain extent and, so, and it ends up being a net positive. But after that certain extent, it, especially within biomechanics, it change, it tends to change so much that it's not, that it's not worth it. And interestingly enough, I, you, you're probably unaware of this, but we have a few of our coaches with a kind of a robust uh, strength training background in, in like team sports and things like that. And they all went through this phenomenon maybe a decade ago where all of the implements that all of the sports used. So baseball bat, lacrosse stick, golf club, and things like that. They wanted to overweight the, 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 the implement, right. And use it yeah. in, a, in, use it in a training session in order to kind of induce more resistance. And what they ended up finding was, is that in many of those applications, if they increase the resistance or the, the additional weight of that implement too much, it messed up the biomechanics and I had a net negative effect with the athlete. We're yeah. kind of seeing the same phenomenon with weighted vests where you can increase it to a certain extent and it affects the biomechanics. It, it affects the biomechanics to an extent to where the training piece of it or the functional outcome piece of it, it's almost like a different sport or a different movement pattern that you're, uh, that, that you're, that you're reinforcing that then could have a net negative. Am I reading through the lines on, this at least initial piece of research on that piece is that there's probably a correct dose response relationship to how much external weight you can apply. And there is probably a net negative to applying too much, too much of it. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, because uh, we actually found that a dose response, right? So we found that if we increase the load, until five percent we are going to stimulate some parameters right or some mechanisms that are traditionally trained in a different way so for example let's speak about 
leg stiffness, right? Leg stiffness, we know that if we do heavy lift things, uh, or heavy lift uh, or, or, or jumping rope, so or we stimulate the shortening cycle in a, in, a, in, a, in a very short time, yeah, uh, we are going to stimulate leg, uh, leg stiffness, right? But is that uh, 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 applicable to running? Yeah, it is. It is, but uh, but it's it that way of training close to the natural movement that right. our athletes are going to perform during a competition. No, it's not. Yeah. Right, we're not jumping uh, rope for competition. Is what you're saying? It's an adjunctive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> adjunctive exercise versus a primary yeah, exercise. Yeah. I, so, I yeah. use I, I I use jumping rope with my athletes. Okay, yeah. and, and and heavy lifts, of course, because we need to stimulate uh, uh, the 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 head of the tendons and 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 the cross sectional area and so on and all the uh, uh, adaptations that you get with heavy liftings and 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 with and with jumping rope. Yeah, so arc stiffness is stimulated and, and, and leg stiffness and so on. But at the end of the day, this is not the way that our runners run, right? right. So, and then we, we, we found a, a very applicable way to train aiming at increasing or optimizing leg spring stiffness in our in our runners, right? So and 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 this is what we aim every single time that we uh, carry out our research study. So it, is it applicable? Yes, or it just mm, another piece of paper? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. let, let me phrase it a different way, right? So if you wanted to improve leg spring stiffness for an athlete, if you thought, if you think that that is a, uh, it, and I would agree with this. If you think that that's a variable that you deliberately want to improve and you want to improve it across the, and make it as specific as possible to a trail runner, you would load them up with three to five or 6% of their body weight in order, in, yep. in order to do that. that's a, that's a reasonable, that's kind of a reasonable application. Yep. If you did much more than that, you're probably not accomplishing that goal of improving and probably in, in your, in, according to your research, at least. You're doing the athlete a disservice and not targeting that specific piece of their biomechanical physiology, right? In, ter in terms yep. of improving uh, uh, leg spring stiffness, because all of these yep. training interventions should have, and whether we talk about interval design and recovery length and interval length and length of the session and all this other stuff, it needs to be targeted at something very specific. The 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 ends need to the means need to need to justify the ends, so to speak. And in this case, if you're thinking about something very specific, we want to keep the running biomechanics the same and improve leg like, spring stiffness and, 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 and potentially improve running economy through that. If you think that that's a valid variable to improve, this is a good framework using a few to 5% of your body weight in order to do that because it seems to be kind of in the sweet spot of additional load that doesn't compromise the rest of the biomechanics. Yeah, yeah. So from my point of view, when when we found that, it was all the effort, you know. So yeah. it was yeah. yes, we have found something that uh, we had no clue. Yeah, or at least evidence based dose, clue. Yeah, right. You don't know what the yeah. right dose is. Is it five percent? Is yeah. it ten percent? Is it no percent? Like you don't know what the right dose is, and yeah. now we're yeah. to narrow it down if you want to give it a little bit of a range. Yeah. Yeah, percent yeah. or something like that is completely yeah and, and and interestingly interestingly enough we, we we saw that leg spring stiffness increased at all the velocities okay and or increased more or it was higher for all the uh, velocities always at a five percent of body weight yeah yeah so that's very interesting and, and 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 for me, it was like, wow, I like it. And it's yeah. applicable across a range of velocities. I think is the yeah the the, the way the way to think about that. Okay, yeah. so before everybody goes out and and buys a a weight vest that's five percent of their body weight to do all their training, 
<laughs> let's um, let, let's kind of add some caveats to this a little bit. So you can put your coaching hat on and your 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 training hat on and kind of get out of the research a little bit, because it does seem like a gold Goldilocks situation to where yeah. you train with this amount, you get a little bit of an extra resistance. Maybe it slows you down a little bit more, which is a common training problem that we have in, hmm. in ultra running is we tend to just train too fast over the yeah. entirety of the of the training spectrum. But w- what other points of like caution or clarification do you think you need to kind of like put on this initial piece of research since it is new and novel and it's just kind of kind of come out? Yeah. So uh, from a coaching perspective, I wouldn't just go straight away to 5%, right? Yeah, so please don't do it. <laughs> uh, we we all know that small changes are sustainable in time. Yeah. So then, if 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 our athletes are are used to train with no load, maybe just put one percent, two percent, so gradually. So this this follows the coaching perspective, okay, and the coaching uh, reasoning, okay. So. Don't go straight away. Yeah, so don't go, don't go straight away for 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 a new thing. So just uh, get it into your uh, training routine gradually. Yeah. So if you want to start using uh, loaded running, then start gradually. And I would advise not going over five percent. Okay, because we already know. And this is luckily enough, yeah, luckily enough, we already know that uh, if we go over, then we are going to jeopardize running kinematics and along with running kinematics, running efficiency and running performance. Perfect. Okay. So now let's extrapolate a little bit more. Um, and this is this is outside the scope of this particular piece of research. But if we're kind of coming at this from the more of the original orientation of how you came at this this piece of research from which is i observed these coaches and athletes in the field using this as a training intervention let's actually test that training intervention and see if it's valid and see under what conditions it would actually be more appropriate and i think you've got a reasonable answer to that five percent of body weight across these this these ranges of speeds can be remarkably effective and 10% 10% of body weight is probably not effective or inappropriate, right? I think both I think both of those those flavors of answers are, are are really important because as ultra runners, we tend to think more is always better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too yeah. much in terms of external load. But l- let's l- let's kind of extrapolate this into all of trail and ultra running. There, there are also a lot of trail and ultra runners and ultra running coaches that I know of that will use weighted vests to induce a hiking modality whenever you know they they wouldn't normally run so i'd mentioned earlier that one of the problems we consistently have in working and training athletes particularly for the longer uh ultra distance events is their training speed is always so much faster than their race speed and that can produce a little bit of a biomechanical mismatch come race day in addition to that they end up spending a lot more time running during training proportionally than they are during the race. There's a significant portion of hiking and, and, and walking in races that uh, in particular in North America where our trails aren't nearly as hard as they are over in Europe, athletes just end up kind of running too much. And so a, a way that a lot of athletes and coaches get around that is to put on a weighted vest and go and and and, and hike around. And usually that weighted vest is actually uh, quite heavy. So I'm wondering if you could kind of like read through the tea leaves a little bit, maybe take your research hat off for a second. Yeah, yeah read through the tea leaves and, and and provide some commentary based on this initial piece of research and also what you know about biomechanics towards that specific piece as well because i know a lot of people are going to have questions on on that specifically yeah so um we know that the longer the distances the longer the time are runners or ultra runners walk right and 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 we also know that uh, at a particular inclination male and female athletes start working and then again the, and, and, and vice versa yeah so they also start running yeah. at a particular inclination they're going to start walking and then vice versa like once that inclination comes down they're going to start running yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah that's it 
And so, yeah, that's that's a very good question indeed. Yeah. Uh, uh, the thing is that we, as as you mentioned before, we tend to or at least tend to think the more the better. Yeah. Right. Right. And 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 this can be extrapolated to the ten thousand hours of practice, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not the more the better. So it's the best the better. Yeah. So uh, what what do I mean? What, what I mean is that uh, you need to do things for a purpose. Yeah. And this is not only for running. This is for your whole life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, if you run every single day 60 kilometers, what are you going to get? An injury. That's clear, right? Yeah. If you don't train hiking, what is going to happen to you when you start hiking? You are not adapted, yeah. right? Then, interestingly enough, you're going to be less efficient working than running. But there is a point where you cannot run. Yeah. So hiking is as important as running for, for, for an ultra distant uh, athlete, right? And I, I, I think I think you agree, right? And uh, so when we prepare our running or, or our training uh, routines for our athletes, we need to take all the things into account yeah so and we need also to take or to consider the not only the next race but the next race to come and the other and the other and what are the aims of our fleet with those races yeah is it an a goal is it a b is it a c race what is it for for our fleet at the end of the day, our fleet needs to be happy, right? Because if not, we are not doing our job, right? <laughs> okay, but hold on, hold on. As much as I appreciate the global perspective here, and I, I take that as a coach, right? We've always got to have athletes' best interest in mind, and we need to look at big, long time frames and things like that. At the end of the day, I'm trying to make this a little bit more, more pragmatic for the coaches and the athletes that are listening. And one of the big pieces of pragmatism that we constantly discuss and debate about is should we actually use weighted vests to hike right you've kind of answered it within the running context right we can run it eight kilometers an hour 10 kilometers an hour within this range of body weight and it's similar here and different here and i think that that provides a good framework yeah what i'm what i'm trying to really drill down into and pin you down on is is there a similar framework that you can at least theorize when we're going in a hiking or a walking modality, meaning this U-shaped curve or N-shaped curve, depending upon your X or Y axis orientation. Yeah. Where is there, is, do you, do, would you theorize that that would be at least similar in a walking modality or it doesn't matter. We can load people up with as much weight as possible, put a big rucksack out on them, 40 kilograms, kind of whatever it is. And they can kind of go out to their heart's content. I just want some a little bit of color commentary on that since you know the space very well. Yeah, I I would say so. Yeah, I would say so because what we try to do is to reflect what our athletes are going to face during competition, right? And they are going to walk, they are going to run. So, is it advisable to use weighted vest while hiking? as much as while running i think so yeah i think we can we can take that uh from a coach perspective and taking my uh researcher head off okay <laughs> also hat off sorry <laughs> yeah and then what else can you say about the the load essentially because one of the things that your paper very elegantly did on the running side was kind of figure out what the appropriate load was is there are there any learning lessons with that and a, that would be applicable in a hiking perspective as well like is there a load that's too much is there a load that's too light would there likely be a sweet spot and because once again people are going to go out and say how much if i want to use this hiking versus running 
how much weight should I put in it? Like, and, and I know that's hard to provide exact answers, but can we at least get some framework for it? Yeah, I think I would stick to the conditions that athletes are going to to face during the competition. So if mm-hmm. athletes are going to carry uh, four kilos in their vest, let's use five, four kilos. It doesn't make sense if you use eight. Why? What's the point? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's what I'm trying to get at is 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 more from your like practical point of view. I know we don't have the research on this. But where where are the parameters would be? Because certainly there's some contingent of athletes and coaches out there that'll, you know, your four kilogram four kilogram example will go five or ten x of that, twenty kilograms or four four forty kilograms, and include that as a deliberate uh as a as a kind of a deliberate mode or deliberate training intervention uh yeah. to either induce hiking or to just add additional resistance to hiking and i've always looked at that as as something per, at least personally i've always looked at something that is something that kind of uh, defies the law of specificity um you mentioned yeah. something that an athlete is going to contend with on race day they're not going to have a in most cases a 20 kilogram or 40 kilogram yeah Back on. Yeah. So why would you why would you do it in training? But I was wondering from your perspective, from a biomechanical perspective, do, does that still defy that law of specificity, or would there be a use case for it? Uh, what I can say is that you just gave me an idea for a new study. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Like we can get people to sign up for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and. Uh, please do that, by the way. I'll I'll bring yeah. it back on, and after you do that study, so please do it. Once you do it, we'll bring it back on. And we'll talk about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try. I'll try my if best. If you design that study, what would you think, though? What would you think would happen? I don't know. I don't know because we we were analyzing gait, yeah, instead of walking gait, instead of running gait, and 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 there are some differences. Okay, and and. We humans are extremely efficient while walking more than while running, yeah. And then uh, uh, I don't know. I assume uh, I don't have an hypothesis right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can work on that. So you. and <laughs> yeah, and 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 I don't really know if yeah, but it's, it's yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, and and I think I'll do it. I'll, I'll, at least I'll, I'll try my best to 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 do that that study, and and that way I can I can come back to. Okay. To the well, we'll we'll leave your <laughs> we'll leave your contact information in the show notes, and whenever you need a subject, we'll I'm sure we can yeah. uh, we can help you find one. Because once again, like I said, I, I I've appreciated this from a running perspective. It's an intervention that I, I have personally seen a lot. Um, I see it and we see it in the U S a little bit more commonly in a walking modality. So I wanted, I wanted to kind of know if we could read between the lines a little bit and, and take any learning lessons from this into, into the walking sphere. Uh, I didn't get the question. What's the question? Oh, there wasn't a question there. It was just more of a, ah, just a comment, right? <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Perfect, man. Well, this has been fascinating. Uh, I, I really appreciated this uh, conversation and I appreciated this piece of work when I've originally, uh, uh, when I, when I originally uh, saw it, uh, cause I think it's something that's directly applicable to a lot of people that are using this type of training intervention. Um, where can people get to know you a little bit better and find more out about the research that you do and, and follow you on any of your social handles? Yeah, so if if they want to follow me on on uh, they can find me on Instagram and in uh, X, so for my Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they type at the uh, D J I E N C, also my name is Diego Jaén. Yeah, on the uh, uh, also it would be at D J A E N C. Yeah. So they can they can if, if, the show notes. Yeah, yeah. If if they need to contact me, I'm always open for, for discussion and, and I always happy to 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 answer questions and, and hearing new ideas, perspective. Uh, and so if you need to contact me, please feel free to do it. Well, I appreciate it, Diego. I'll leave uh, links to that as well as links to the paper 
uh, in the show notes. It is a free uh, open access paper, so anybody can yeah. dive in and read it. And uh, keep up the good work over there, man. I can't wait to see the hiking study that's going to come out in a couple of years, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jason. So thank you very much for, for the invite again. Uh, I, I really enjoy the, the conversation. And, and of course, you, 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 you gave me new ideas. Yeah, so thank you very much. And, and, and I really appreciate uh, your time. Awesome. Appreciate it. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Diego for first off producing this piece of research that is sorely needed. And I hope that we've inspired him to do a follow up piece of research where we look at a weight vest intervention in a hiking modality. Links will be in the show notes to everything that we talked about, as well as all of the social handles that Diego has. I encourage you guys to go and check it out. If you found this uh, podcast fascinating, go ahead and check out my new research newsletter, Research Essentials for Ultra Running. This is going to be a paper that we review in depth and we put in a future edition of that particular e-magazine because I think it is one that is so incredibly relevant to trail and ultra runners nowadays. It's a training intervention that I see used all too often. And as I said during the intro of this podcast, it's one that we really don't know a whole heck of a lot about in terms of how much weight to put on, what speeds are relevant, and what is actually going on underneath the hood when we use these types of interventions. Link will be in the show notes to sign up for that particular newsletter. And I would expect it to come out in maybe the December or the January edition if we have all of our stuff together. I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you listeners out there. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and your training partners. If you think the information contained within this podcast is valuable to them, go ahead and share it with them. That is the best way to spread the love and to spread the info. And I'm so incredibly grateful for whenever I hear this podcast is going to get proliferated across the space of trail and ultramarathon runners and coaches. That is it for today, folks. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.